Ich darf Tom Zistra begrüßen. Er ist Gründungspartner von Greenland und vor allem auch eben Senior Consultant bei der, äh, bei der Weltbank, dort im also. Bereich der Open Data und hat dort entsprechend spannende Projekte gemacht. Er ist auch ein Pionier. Ich habe schon 2011 das erste Mal Kontakt mit ihm. Das freut mich sehr. Und He will talk now in English, yes. as some of you have um, requested it on Twitter. Uh, we have now the um, possibility to listen to you. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, Matthias. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I will also be speaking English because then I will be faster than when I try to do it in German. Uh, and I have too many slides for 20 minutes. Um, so let's get started. Um, what I would like to talk about today with you is how public service how the public sector can deploy opening data as a policy tool in, you know, in support of reaching their own policy aims. Um, but first, it's uh, good to be back. I've spoken at the Open Data Conference in 2012 in Zurich, and, um, and it's good to be back. But at the same time, it makes me wonder, why are we still here? Why do we get together every year in rooms like these, not just in Switzerland, but in many countries around the world, debating the same questions. You know, why does it feel, after eight years of working with public sector bodies around the world opening up their data, that I still need to convince every single civil servant in the world, and I still need to convince every single civil entrepreneur or every single civil data scientist in the world that open data is a good idea? Why is that? Part of it, I think, is that what we see in terms of real impact being delivered with open data is still very much fragmented. There's no clear picture yet. Despite all the promises, we've seen the amounts, of, well, was it $6 trillion of McKinsey? But that doesn't really mean anything when you try to translate that back to the local level. What does that mean for the spreadsheets that the city of Bern publishes? How does that correlate with the $6 trillion? We don't know. So when the European Commission asks me questions like, so where's the next Google? It is those three people with a laptop with a MacBook in Starbucks, somewhere in Bulgaria. But we only will be able to recognize them as the next Google in 20 years time, when they are the next Google. Until then, we have no clue about who they are. So yes, it's nice that we have this climate cooperation, which is basically the first billion dollar exit for an open data startup. But what does it really mean? Because if we want to see true impact, are we actually looking in the right places? Shouldn't we be looking where we want to see impact? If we know why we're doing it, as was debated earlier, um, wouldn't that be a much more logical way of figuring out whether open data is of value to us? Or would that not make us end the sort of fragmentation? And when you do that, if you start zooming in on real cases, it becomes much easier to see impact, but it also means you have a lot more work because zooming in on real cases makes you end up on a boat like this in uh, the Finnish Gulf, uh, like a colleague of mine, Mark, uh, did a couple of weeks ago, he was on an icebreaker and he was looking at how satellite information actually makes the operation of this vessel more efficient. By using satellite data, they see how thick the ice is over the route that they are trying to navigate. It makes them choose the places where the ice is thinnest. That saves them lots of fuel. It saves them a helicopter that doesn't have to fly out and scout where they need to go. It cuts back on time that the ships with cargo need to cut across the Botnian Gulf, and it cuts down prices in supermarkets in the north of Finland. These are real impacts, but you only find them if you, you know, like a little detective, trace them all back and do all those little steps. But if you do that, if you start reasoning from the why, finding the impact actually becomes much easier. So what I've been trying to do in my work, mostly with local governments, um, is to build these type of triangles where we start with a specific question, a policy issue that is in play, and then look at what data is connected to that. And can we provide stakeholders or new stakeholders with new agency if they have access to that data? And then can we create a little bit like an engine that creates value for all involved around that issue? And that was the starting point for a program that we did in the past 18 months with a province in the Netherlands uh, with nine municipal governments and the regional government. And we invited each of those public sector bodies to take one specific policy issue, and then we would hunt down the data connected to it, publish that with them, and hunt down the stakeholders connected to it, and bring them together, 
and start talking about how they might use the data in support of uh, the policy issue concerned. Um, what you then get is a wide variety in questions that people wanted to address with opening data. One city said, well, we have two shopping zones and we have a lot of shops that stand empty. And our plan actually is to bring those two zones together and then we have all the shops in one place and less empty uh, buildings. And they used data there to engage with entrepreneurs in the city and to engage with possible alternative users of buildings in the city uh, to, in, to get into a conversation. Another municipal government has, suffers from flash flooding after heavy rainfall. And one of the primary causes is that people in the Netherlands are quite lazy when it comes to their garden. So we tend to pave our gardens over because then you don't need to mow the grass and there's no weeding to be done. But the effect of that is that rainwater ends up in the sewer much more quickly because it gets transported out of my paved over garden into the sewer. So my individual decision actually impacts flooding risks for me and my neighbors. But there was no way of actually debating that until you put the data on the table and show how all those connections work and allow others to take a look there. So you see different types of issues that were being addressed in this program. But what you also notice is that it takes a quite a radically different view on what it means to provide public service. Because the civil servants involved in this project in the north of the Netherlands these were civil servants that would normally always be on the inside of the public sector body they were working with. They would never communicate with citizens directly because they were maintaining data sets, collecting stuff. And all of a sudden they found themselves on the outside of government, talking directly to citizens. And it challenges the way that the public sector body involved actually sees you know, how they provide service, how does that work. And we see in different countries, this is the UK and in the United States and in France, that in fact there are spots where this radical new notion of what providing services is taking root. Where it is citizen-centered design that is the starting point. Where the issue is the starting point and not how can we make sort of, you know, the government process as easy as possible. No, how do we actually create impact with delivering service? And Henri Fadier, who is the chief data officer in France, he basically runs a startup inside French government and he takes open data as a, as a flying wheel underneath this triangle of trying to hook up policy issues with the data sets concerned and with the stakeholders concerned. And open data is sort of an underlayer on that. And the reason that uh, that is interesting is because it brings more stakeholders to the table. Where at first you're trying to solve an issue with just the obvious stakeholders around you, all of a sudden you can bring much more eyes to the same issue. And that actually allows us to improve the quality of public service. Normally, a public sector process or a service that is being provided to me as a citizen, it deterior uh, deteriorates, its quality goes down when more people use it. If I go to City Hall to renew my passport, that's fine. If me and all my neighbors do it at the same time, I think it's crappy service because I have to wait a long time. Digitization of pro uh, processes solve that in the sense that digital processes allow me and my neighbors to all at the same time ask for the same service without us noticing a decline in quality. But the level stays the same. Now if you bring more stakeholders to the same issue, it might actually be a way of improving the quality of public service because those new stakeholders bring in new skills, they bring in new solutions and they bring in new channels of delivery. And we know that open data around the world does bring new stakeholders to the table. This is Transport for London. Uh, they opened up all their public transport data. Um, and they were previously building their own uh, mobile application as well. They opened up their data and 5,000 people started interacting with the data. Building all kinds of niche applications that deployed Transport for London data in all kinds of different settings and contexts. The end result is that Transport for London actually stopped building their own uh, mobile application. They simply provide the data and the website, and they stopped building the app, saving them a million pounds. Because they could not compete with the hundreds of niche apps that actually address specific needs in the population on how to use that public transport data. So bringing more stakeholders to the, to the, stakeholders to the table actually improved quality of service, as perceived by me as a citizen you know, traveling through London, but it reduced the outlay and the effort of government itself. So it's those new stakeholders and existing stakeholders that find new agency 
with open data that create the impact that we're looking for, that help create the building blocks towards the seven trillion or six trillion that McKinsey wants. And one of those stakeholders finding new agency in open data is government itself. We routinely notice that as soon as a public sector body opens up data, it's other parts of the public sector that start using it quite intensively. So much so that the city of Manchester booked a six and a half million pound saving on a yearly basis because all of a sudden their own people knew where the information was and how to find it and how to work with it. So government is one of those stakeholders finding new agency. But it also allows us, as civic entrepreneurs, as Hannes just said, to become the front end of public services. And we've all seen examples like these, Fix My Street, where it is civil society that creates an entry point into processes uh, connected to public service delivery. And by doing so, they improve the quality that I perceive, they improve the way that I can communicate with my government, and it's all based on having the data available. That also leads to automation of processes that were sort of wieldy before, like Fracht in Staat in Germany, where basically you have the, the freedom of information process being automated. Not everybody in the public sector will like that, but for me as a citizen, again, this is an improvement of service. And the list goes on, whether it's waiting times in Swedish healthcare, or um, managing changes in laws within Austrian companies, or picking a school and finding the least corrupt school in Moldova, in all these cases, it is civic groups that actually create front ends to public services in support of existing policy aims. It helps the public sector to do that. And in the Netherlands you see something around procurement, uh, where a uh, company actually reduces procurement costs for public sector by 50%. And things like uh, making a children's book reality. There's a US uh, children's book called Hansje Brinker, which is the myth of a small Dutch boy putting his finger in the dam to prevent the flooding. Never happened, obviously, uh, but they love it in the US. Um, but there's now a company in the Netherlands called Hansje Brinker. And what they actually do is use satellite and radar images to detect one millimeter deformations in dams and infrastructure, and then sort of you know, prioritize uh, maintenance schedules for the government and large infrastructure companies uh, to do that. An interesting bit is that in this process where we collectively create public services or services that actually are in support of public policies and pu uh, public uh, goals, that I as a citizen can also use data as an entryway into that. By entering or adding my own data into the mix, I'm actually becoming a more participatory stakeholder in the process. And when you look at motivations on why people do this, We've seen you know, money and love and uh, other motivations, but the interesting thing to me is that if you look at a specific open data project, and it maybe started out as a commercial outfit, as this Dutch company, uh, which do um, digitization of large infrastructural projects in the Netherlands, speeding up the entire process, reducing the complaint period, um, and saving all stakeholders involved a lot of money. Um, they started doing this commercially. But if you look at the impact, for public service, this is a huge efficiency gain. For me as a citizen living next to a project like that, I all of a sudden feel heard uh, in the process. I know how to engage with the uh, builders and how to engage with the government and see my concerns being used in that process and actually become part of the plan. So it also, for me, it adds a layer of transparency and it makes the entire project more effective. So whatever the starting point is, if you start building a transparency project, you usually also end up creating impacts in the other way around. Because that uh, procurement uh, service I just showed, that is built on top of a transparency project of, on open data. So whatever your starting point is, whatever your starting motivation, in the end it doesn't really matter. For governments, open data is also a way to with their public services and, and in trying to reach their policy goals to look beyond the scope of themselves. By definition, the public sector only looks at its own geographic territory. Whereas a lot of the challenges that uh, national governments face are by nature more international. And open data allows governments to look over the edge of their own garden. For instance, with open corporates, as Hannes already showed us, uh, this visualization, um, but what Open Corporates allows is to map out all the connections between different companies, who owns what, 
where's the network and map it out. What you see here is a global map with uh, companies connected to Goldman Sachs, the bank, uh, and at every dot is a single legal entity. Um, the countries are relative in size to the number of legal entities within their borders. So every dot here in the US is a legal entity connected to Goldman Sachs. This is the Netherlands here in the middle, and then there's connections to companies around the world. And what you immediately see is that, yes, you recognize the US, uh, but this is a rather strange blob. This is the Cayman Islands. <laughs> a lot of legal entities of Goldman Sachs are in the Cayman Islands. Uh, this is Luxembourg, also slightly larger than <laughs> India here. Um, so, so it immediately shows you how those connections are. Switzerland is missing in this picture because you don't open up the data that is relevant in this visualization. Um, but the thing is that this is actually pretty good information for the Dutch tax service as well because they consistently have to deal with international corporations that come up to them saying, hey, we want to route a couple of billion euros through Amsterdam, would that be okay with you? And they go, well, yeah, maybe if you pay like one or two percent, that sounds good. But they have no idea how that actually reverberates across the European Union and what it means for the Irish or Greek or German economy if they do that, if they seal that deal. This type of data actually helps them enlarge their scope. And again, that goes in different directions, whether it's about European tenders being available across Europe. And again, it goes into collaborative mode, where communities like OpenStreetMap come and help out national governments in the aftermath of disasters like the earthquake in Nepal, where it's OpenStreetMap as a community that mobilizes to create accurate maps after the earthquake for the entire country so that help, uh, aid services and help projects can find their way more easily. And the European Union is busy funding and trying to create, let's say, the infrastructure that allows us to do this cross-border thing with open data. There's Fireware, which aims to basically create a, sort of a generic API to all the data in Europe, so that for me as a developer, it doesn't really matter anymore where the data is coming from. And there's projects like the uh, Open Data Incubator Network, uh, also EU funded. That across-the-border thing also applies to different sectors. A lot of sectors, in the Netherlands for instance, uh, it's not the government that is the primary stakeholder. It's uh, private entities, companies that are the primary stakeholders uh, or the primary data holders in sectors like finance and healthcare, food production. And there too, open data is a way to, to build bridges between public sector and those uh, uh, companies in order to be able to address the issues that are within that sector. And we luckily see companies opening up. This is Leander, it's the largest um, energy transporter in the Netherlands, and they opened up all their um, consumption data for Dutch households. And this is actually the first time that the Dutch government has access to this type of data in determining their policy. I would very much like to see this in healthcare as well, because right now the Dutch government does not know until three years from now what hospitals and insurers are today spending on healthcare. So it's impossible to them, for them to actually create a working feedback loop in creating policy. We need the data to be able uh, to do that. Now, if you want to build those triangles, those connections between issues, the data involved, the stakeholders involved, if you want to build that sort of self-perpetuating uh, engine, you, we need to look at government databases as a infrastructure that needs to be available. Um, uh, and that turns quickly into a national data infrastructure. And several countries in Europe have built systems of what they call key registers, where they take the data sets that are at the core of the public process, connect those, and open them, open them up to the public as well. And that becomes the fundament on which all the other small data sets, like three spread spreadsheets about expenses for the city council in Bern, become relevant uh, in a way that actually works towards the 7 trillion. The Netherlands has such a system, uh, 13 uh, core data sets connected uh, and mostly open to the public. And Denmark as well launched a roadmap where they said, well, if, in order to solve our societal problems, we need to provide everybody with good base data about the status of a country. And they launched this in 2012 and they're already nearly finished. And again, here we see attempts where that is being done collaboratively as well, where new stakeholders are being brought in. Uh, for instance, in France, um, um, 
The French government has three national address databases. They're all with La Poste, and even La Poste doesn't really know which one is the correct one. So they sell all three, and whichever one suits your purposes best is apparently the correct one for you. Um, but there's no one address database that covers the entirety of France. So the French open data team at Edela um, worked together again with the OpenStreetMap community and the tax office and a wide range of local authorities to build a new base address register for France and open that up as open data. And so now for the first time through a collaborative process, France actually has uh, an accurate address database. So when can we stop meeting like this every year in a room? When can we stop doing this and head out into the sunshine and uh, enjoy the scenery just out front in the building? The end game to me for the public sector with open data is that when opening up all the data that can be opened up by default and by design is part of their mission and their operation and the way that they sort of construct the institutions. And we see some examples where that has already happened. The city of Ghent in Belgium, they use their own open data to create their website. It's not a separate thing. The website is a product of their open data. This is the uh, Agency for Cultural Heritage in the Netherlands, and they realized early on that the only way that they can provide real service to archaeologists and um, you know, archives around the country and uh, communities around Dutch windmills and stuff, um, the only way that they can pr provide accurate service to these entities, which is executing their public task, is by doing it through opening everything up. So if you go to the website, there's a list here that seem like links, but they actually take you directly to uh, a way to interact with the data sets underneath it. And then, data becomes the primary way of um, communicating with the public. This is uh, the city of uh, the province of Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. Um, they publish everything about, uh, about objects, so geo-objects in public space. And it's the only way that they actually communicate with contractors who maintain the roads and who maintain the parks. Everybody goes to the same data portal and contractors can click through you know, to uh, you know, understand the contracts that they actually signed. That's in a back office system. But this is the only way that the province actually communicates. And it's no longer a separate channel through which they publish data. Data is the way that they communicate. And that allows interaction in a way that we have not had with our government before, where data is a way of starting conversations and creating conversations, like this dashboard for Amsterdam, and this dashboard in uh, Los Angeles. So that's my challenge to you today. If we want to see impact, we need to start reasoning from where do you want to see that impact. And from that starting point, ask yourself what data is connected to it and do I have access to it? Is there a way of opening that data up? And what other stakeholders are involved with that question? And can I mobilize them with the data? Does it provide new agency to stakeholders if the data is being put on the table? And is that something I need to do myself? Is that something that others need to be doing? Or is that something that we can do collaboratively and within just where we are or across the borders? And this is the challenge that I would like to take you into the workshops this afternoon. Continuously ask yourself, where do I want to see impact? And how do I create the little engine that delivers that? So that we don't you know, look at the big golden mountains and the promises, but start working on solving the issues around you. Thank you for your time and attention.